For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I have Jose Aguilar, Global Brand Management Director at Nestle Nutrition. Jose leads the super premium infant formula category, which is about a billion dollar business, managing innovation projects as well as geographic expansion and the renovation of the communications platform. Jose is a senior global marketing and commercial executive, and he's got an extensive global experience leading businesses in a number of different countries in Europe, Asia, Latin America, and most recently based in the U.S., managing a a business in the Middle East. He's also lived in four different countries around the world. He's a native of Mexico and truly a global citizen. Today on the show, we're going to talk about his global experience, leading global teams and global brands, and lessons learned. I hope you enjoy the show. Well, Jose, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. How are you, Alan? I'm good. I'm good. It's so good to talk to you again. So I wondered if you could start off by just telling us a little bit about your role at Nestle and your career leading up to this role. I think I'll start with uh, my career. You know, I've been lucky enough to really stumble upon global business and global marketing at the very early of my career. I was uh, fresh off um, my undergrad studies and I joined the Gallup organization, the polling company at the time. They have uh, moved from polling a lot, but uh, the polling company and uh, they gave me the opportunity just two years into the company to move from uh, Mexico where I started. I'm from Mexico City to the U.S. to be in the Hispanic studies group at the time in Austin, Texas. And then a few months after that, there were some elections going on in Venezuela in the 90s. And uh, again, the organization gave me the opportunity to be in Venezuela to lead the Venezuela and South American organization for Gallup. And it was a tremendous opportunity because it gave me the chance to move away from more the technical side of market research to really managing a business and really been exposed to global marketing, at least in Latin America. And I fell in love with it. I absolutely fell in love with it. I said, I want to do this for the rest of my life, be a global executive. And uh, then that's when I pursued my MBA because I knew I needed to hone my management skills of being more a technical person as uh, from training and undergrad. And from then, I've been pursuing uh, marketing, which is a passion of mine, and global marketing, which is, I will say, a specialty in itself, and looking for roles that uh, give me that opportunity. I will say that my career has been driven by three main pillars. One is this particular point of being global, global opportunities, global businesses. The second is to be in organizations that allow me to really learn all the different aspects of marketing and give me the opportunity to manage all the functions of marketing. So to be a really well-rounded marketeer from digital, social media, traditional advertisement, etc. And the third one is I've been lucky enough, but also pursuing to be in world-class organizations, you know, that want to be number one in the marketplace they compete, that they want to be ethical and innovative in the industries that they compete. So that's what I've been looking for. Uh, That led me to Nestle today, leading a global business, uh, primarily an Asian and Middle Eastern business in the super premium category, um, really taking advantage that the middle class is rising and there's more disposable income in many of these countries and uh, offering an incredible product, which is an infant formula with the best technology in its category. That's quite the experience you've had and, and starting at an early part in your career, becoming global or at least cross country. Building global brands is a huge challenge for a lot of organizations and a lot of folks that I talk to actually. And I think there's this notion of trying to maintain consistency of brands across markets, yet be locally relevant. And I'm just curious what you've seen you know, in the various roles and companies and even you know peers that you've talked to. Yes, uh, one of the challenges is to how to be culturally relevant. At the end, the, being marketing or global marketing is the same thing. You know, it's about building meaningful, relevant 
brands that resonate with consumers and entice them to buy your product rather than the competition. What is a bit more difficult in global businesses is uh, that the stage at which each brand is in different countries may be different, or you need to be sensitive to the cultural differences. So when you say some things in certain countries, you cannot in others. So you need to be very aware and very mindful of those type of uh, nuances. However, what I have seen overall is that the needs of consumers are relatively the same around the world. You know, many people who probably don't travel much, they will say, oh, this country is very different than this country in consumer behavior. I will say that for the most part, consumers' needs are relatively, have the same foundation, are the same. That is even more is becoming more prominent in today's economy that is very connected. I think people, urban people, millennials, for example, that live in Mexico City or live in New York City or live in Manila, Philippines, are more similar as urban millennials than a Manila guy who is from the city of Manila versus a rural area in Philippines. I have more differences between those consumers than urban consumers, for example. So, yes, there are uh, nuances in cultural differences that you need to be uh, mindful. I think that becomes very relevant at the tactical execution of your plans, but not at really at the consumer need base foundation when you start developing your strategies for marketing. So that's what I have seen, you know, and then mindful, as I mentioned, that brands are at different stage in their life cycle in different countries. So you need to be also careful on that. Hmm. Well, so how can a marketing leader help a global team be successful and hopefully efficient at global branding? How do you do that? I think successful and efficient is interesting choice of words. You know, I think you, as a global executive, you need to have a very high EQ, which is, I guess, in any business. But you need to be very mindful of the differences between countries. And when I'm talking about differences, I'm not talking only about consumer needs or consumer cultural differences in consumers' background, but also even in the work setting. When you invite colleagues from around the world, we are brought up in different settings growing up. So, for example, in Latin America, probably we're more chatty, we talk more, we are probably not on time, we're not to be like the meeting starts at <laughs> 9 o'clock, probably need to kind of start at 9, 10, uh, we call it the Latin time, you know? <laughs> so other, organ- other cultures are more quiet, more shy, they don't talk much in, in meetings, in global meetings, and when you have 10, 15 people in the table. However, they are very vocal when it's more one-on-one. So you need to be very mindful of those differences. Again, not at the consumer behavior level, but also in your work settings. And be mindful that you need to be aware of those differences and how to make the teams work together. So that's number one. The second is, I would say, to listen. Listen carefully and listen deeply on what your colleagues are saying around the world. The global roles are primarily a relationship building roles, you know, influencing cross-functionally, cross-regionally. Colleagues that don't report to you, but you need to work with them to make some strategies successful. So you need to be listening attentively to the demands and the opinions of, of your colleagues around the world. And the third point that will make a team's efficient I guess, is leading. At the end, yes, you need to be mindful of the differences. You need to listen to the differences and the opinions, but also you need to lead and prioritize objectives, projects, etc. So if you have those three elements, I think you can make teams work very effectively around the world. You've already kind of addressed this, which is you know, navigating cultural differences and, and the fact that you think or you see that many times there's a lot more similarities than there are differences. How can a marketer monitor or understand those cultural differences when they do matter? And then how do you assess whether we're talking about the same thing, like you described the millennials in urban settings, being very similar across countries. I guess, how do you sort through what's a meaningful difference and where are we actually talking about the same thing globally? I will say it starts with data. At the end, marketing is about data and, and lately it's also about data. You need to have a very deep understanding of the data that you have in front of you. And actually one of the key things that a global marketing needs to bring to the table is an understanding of the local market. In many instances, Global central teams are perceived more as a tax 
to local organizations than in a support to local <laughs> yeah. organizations. And it has to do with the fact that central teams, again, need to be very aware of consumer behaviors in particular countries. So when you have that, and that comes, I guess, with uh, studying and experience and learning all the time, you know, I mean, every time you learn something, every time you go to a trip. So you are able to discuss those consumer differences uh, based on the data and also based on the experience that you have. Having the opportunity to look at the same data points in different countries is when you start to discern, is this truly a difference or is this something that we can manage? And of course, there's always back and forth in the discussions, you know, but again, a global marketer with experience, with the deep knowledge of the different markets should be able to discern what is relevant and what is not relevant in those differences, you know? And so when you think about the similarities, can you maybe describe an example when it doesn't have to be exact, just so we get a flavor for what similarities look like? Let's say the mother of an infant, as I mentioned, I think the needs are the same. The love and the care of the mother for the child is universal. universal. You know? Yeah, I think that the need and the love and how the mother conveys that love to the child is pretty much universal. Now, there are differences in that love, you know? Some cultures are stricter. They want the child to be extremely well-educated. Other cultures rely more on the family to provide support and education. So those are the tactical differences that you find. You know, some countries may have the healthcare professional with more influence on the decision of what type of formula the mother will take. Other cultures will prefer more the family and friends to have that influence, you know. So those are the type of differences. Again, the love and the care and the need for to provide to the child the best is the same everywhere. How do you get to that is different. Gotcha, gotcha. I appreciate the example. I think it helps to illustrate the point that some of these things are truly universal just to being human beings, caring human beings. Yep. So, well, so last time we talked, I had to write all of this down because I was just like, I cannot believe this. I'm going to spout off some stats. So you've lived in four countries, yep. visited and done business in every country in Latin America, Western Europe, and most of them in Eastern Europe and Asia and manage the Middle East region while living in Cairo. Yes. I mean, you are truly the definition of a global citizen. <laughs> and I think that's even how you introduced yourself to me yeah. <laughs> at one point. How have these experiences really shaped your perspective? You know, as I mentioned to you, I had the fortune to, at the very early stage of my career, being exposed to that. And what I have learned is we are more similar than different around the world, you know? <laughs> and that's something very interesting for me is, I think we're more similar than different. And that's when you see all these political issues and social issues going around the world, it's like, I think we are so close together in that sense, you know? But what this has shaped also is because of that, because we are more similar than different and because, yeah, we have our cultural differences. What I have learned is to be inclusive. I love to have teams that, bring different perspectives to the table that have different backgrounds from many angles, economical, cultural, social, etc. Be very inclusive in my day-to-day, -day. very respectful as well. There are differences that are very relevant as well, <laughs> that you need to be mindful and respectful of those differences. Normally it has to do with politics or religion, and you need to be respectful of those differences. And also you need to be understanding of those differences as well, you know, and understanding the impact that that differences may bring to your business decision. So that's what I have learned, I guess, in being a global citizen. I truly believe I'm a global citizen. I'm from Mexico origin, as I mentioned. I love Mexico, of course, but people ask me, do you miss this country? Do you miss this city? I just look forward to the future. You know, I truly enjoy being exposed to different cultures, to different things. And, you know, one of the things I do actually I'm thinking about, sorry for thinking now, but in one of your previous questions, to be sensitive about the differences and truly understand the businesses and the cultures where you do, where you conduct your business, is I try to be in the farthest away hotel from where the meeting is being held. You know, in many occasions, you go from the airport to a meeting room in a hotel, you sleep in the same hotel, you go down, and then you leave the country. That doesn't give you any exposure to a country. 
I try to be not as far as possible because sometimes it's like two hour commute time, you know, but right. I try to have t- some time with a taxi driver, walk around, you know, and that gives you a good perspective of the country, you know. Today, I go to an airport and just by looking at the airport, the infrastructure, the way they set up and the people gives me a, a pretty good idea of a country's development, you know. So that's something, that's just a tip that works very well, you know, is don't just go have meetings and leave, you know, try to interact, stay over the weekend in a particular country, stay a little bit away from your meeting room and those 15, 20 minutes, you will learn a lot, you know. So those are the type of things to be inclusive, to be respectful, to be understanding. That's what I've learned in my trips, you know. I think those are great tips, too, of how to immerse yourself in the country that you're visiting, whether on business or otherwise. And we're more interconnected today, you know. I mean, the world is flat. (laughs) Maybe it's changing a little bit, but I don't know if it's the world is flat today, even all the, the policies and politics going on around the world. But at least we are super interconnected in the world. As I mentioned to you, people from Manila, Shanghai, kids, adults have very similarities to another urban person in, in the developed world, you know? Mm-hmm. I was going to ask, you know, besides traveling, are there any other tips that you might have for folks that really have a global perspective? I think read a lot and learn a lot. I try to read as many books and and particularly magazines. I read a lot of magazines from every topic and subject. You know, I the big business um, journals, the Wall Street Journal, Business Week, Forbes, etc. I read People magazine. You know, I <laughs> I read cultural issues. I read um, there's a beautiful magazine called Foreign Affairs about more global economies. So it's reading a lot, everything that comes to your hands. Research, today everything's available on the web. So research what's going on in the different countries and probably join associations, trade associations. All big countries have big trade groups representing their interests in the major cities. So so join those trade groups or join their newsletters and, and you will learn a lot what's going on in those countries because you know interestingly also something that helps a lot connecting with people around the world is knowing what's going on in that country you know if you go to poland should you know that a month ago there was a national election and this president won or soccer you know football is number one sport in the world did poland go to the world cup or not pass to the world cup or not you know those type of uh understanding of those connecting culturally with people around the world it, uh, it will get you a long way you know yeah that's good advice good advice so let's switch gears a little bit and, and talk about your your latin roots and specifically you, you know your mexican roots and you know, what do you think of the impact that companies and brands from you know mexico and, and the latin american region have had on the world stage very minimal unfortunately i will say <laughs> yeah one of my we can speak for hours on this topic, Alan. One of the things that I see is most, if you see the top brands in the world ranked, for example, by Brand Z, which is one of the rankings by Miwar Brand, which is part of the WPP group, the top brands are today more in the technology sector, you know, Apple, Google, Facebook. But we're not 12 years ago. 12 years ago, there were more retail and food brands today the top brands in the world are moving to technology those the technology has been driven lately by of course the united states still i think half of the top brands in the world come from america and and as a percentage of the value contribution is even bigger and asia you know chinese brands are going up the ranks and i think 12 years ago the first time brand z published the rankings there was one chinese brand in the top 100 or in the top 10, I don't remember exactly, but today there are far more Chinese brands in the top rankings, and that's the investment in technology. Unfortunately, Latin America has not invested in technology, in local technology. If you see the top brands from Latin America from this report, the Brand Z report, they are more in the food consumer sector and some retails and some consumer banks. So the impact on the global basis of Latin American brands is very minimal because of the investment and the priorities of, of, of the Latin American countries. And i love to change that, but uh, I mean, it's difficult. Now, interestingly, I think Latin American brands are more local 
again, because they are more in the consumer sector and that brands that have been for many, many years in the marketplace. So they connect very deeply, very emotionally with consumers. And that's something potentially that could be a learning for other brands around the world is how to really connect very emotionally with your consumer, you know, it's something that global brands can learn from Latin American brands. But overall, Latin America, in a sense, is a bit of isolated with very local regional brands, but not truly global brands. And it has to do, again, with investment in technology. Today, again, the leading brands are technology-based brands, you know. So. Right. Well, it's interesting to get your perspective. I mean, because you, you hear about a couple, but to your point, not very many. Yeah, yes. And, uh, you know, the, some Mexican brands are growing in the U.S. Right. because of the Hispanic market. Um, right. as you know, the Hispanic market, the Latino community is growing tremendously in the U.S. There's a lot of influence. There's more purchase power, especially in the second, third generations. They're becoming more educated. And there's a lot of connections. Actually, it's funny. Yesterday, I went to buy a sandwich here in New York City. And in a beautiful catering to professionals, small sandwich place, they offered Coke and Mexican Coke. <laughs> you know, that's very typical of a person who grew up in Mexico. The Coke from in Mexico, for some reason, is uh, the flavor is a bit different. It's sweeter, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And I was amazed, you know, that, that locale catering to non-Hispanics has Mexican Coke, you know? So, uh, so there's an opportunity to grow in the Hispanic market. Some brands are growing. Bimbo and Bimbo bought Sara Lee and other brands, big brands in, in the U.S. I think they will have some influence in the future in the U.S. market just because of the Latino. But I think that these brands have not gone beyond the Latino. I think maybe there's an opportunity to go beyond because they are, they are good products and good brands, you know? And a good marketer who wants to do that, I, I welcome to discuss that with him or her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Well, I've had a number of folks on the show to talk about income inequality and, you know, essentially a, a little bit of a slide, potentially a future downfall of a Western economy. And giving your global perspective and the global businesses that you've run and, and managed, I'd love to get your thoughts on it. How do you see the world evolving from those two? It's interesting. Um, and a lot of debate on this question as well. <laughs> I think the world power, in a sense, is moving east. You know, China is becoming an amazingly, I mean, it's, already, it's today a very important country, of course. I mean, any company that doesn't have a clear strategy for China is going to lose rapidly. You need to have a very, very strong and very good strategy for China. So I think, yeah, the center of power is moving east. If you look at the investments that the developed countries are doing versus what China is doing, for example, is impressive. I mean, you see the articles, like, again, in these um, specialized magazines. And AI, artificial intelligence, for example, is going to be dominated by China in the future. They are putting much more budget as a percentage of GDP on technology, on artificial intelligence than the U.S., for example. So I think, yeah, the, the power is shifting. Does that mean that the U.S. won't be a world leader? Of course not. I think the U.S. and Europe, Europe has been a, a world leader. The U.S. will continue to be a, a world leader. But now you have a very strong counterpart in China, you know, and in some industries, in some areas, China will be much more powerful than the U.S. And you see the, the middle class rising in many parts of the world, in the, in the developing world, you know, but particularly in Asia. Coming from Latin America and Mexico particularly, I have followed the growth of GDP and GDP per capita, which is a better measure of truly the wealth of a country. And I compared Mexico, let's say, to South Korea. The, nobody should compare now to China because it's, it's going to be an outlier. <laughs> but if you compare Mexico, it's about 120 million people. South Korea is about 50 million, 60 million people. In 1960, South Korea's GDP per capita was about $89 or something like that. Sorry, $150. Mexico was $342 of $1960. Today, Mexico's GDP per capita is about $8,000. South Korea's GDP per capita is $27,000, give and take. Wow. So it is impressive, for example, what South Korea has done in terms of policies and investments and priorities, you know, I mean, and you see the brands as well from Korea, you know, Samsung and Hyundai and all these brands that are global in nature today. And you 
didn't hear of them in the 70s at all. So the power is shifting east, the investment is getting there, the middle class is rising tremendously around the world, particularly in the Asian countries. Latin America, middle class is growing not as fast as in other parts of the world. So the middle class is rising. The inequality probably is rising as well, you know? People Mm -hmm. who have opportunity to go to the middle class are getting there, but there will be very poor people and there's some differences. In the U.S., I think the inequality is growing as well tremendously. You know, I see, I'm very concerned about the inequality in the U.S. I think if not today, in the future, the U.S. will have the biggest difference between rich and poor in the developed world. And that's worrisome, you know. You see today people asking for money on the streets here in New York City that looks like a third world country. And it's sad and it's concerning, being American as well, that this is happening in the U.S., you know, that inequality. So there are good stories and bad stories. The middle class is rising in the world, in the developing world. However, there are people left behind. And in the U.S., there's a lot of people left behind as well, you know. So we need to be mindful because what that means is not only from an economic standpoint bad for the country, but as a business, is if your market is shrinking, also is bad, you know. Right, right, exactly. It can definitely put a cap on your growth for exactly, sure. Exactly. Let's switch gears. I want to. It's always important for me to get to know the person behind you know this interview and, and allow my listeners to do that as well. So, I love starting off with this question, which is, you know, is there an experience in your past that defines who you've become today? I don't know if there's one experience. I think it's all my experience. Uh, You know, I have the fortune to have a very strong family, both in my mom and my dad. You know, my dad is, uh, I consider one of my role models, to be honest with you. He he is very smart. He's uh, a very successful physician in Mexico. And he always taught us to be the best. I remember always saying, be the best at what you want to be. You know, if you just want to swipe the floors, be the best at swiping the floors and do your best. I remember going from school in Mexico, you have grades from one to 10. And if I came with a 9.7, he would ask me, why not 10, you know? So, <laughs> uh, so he really pushed us to be the best we could be. And the respect he has for everybody and my mom always supporting there, I think that's what defined me, you know, and my family is, uh, have a strong uh, family and a strong role model on the ethics and the work ethics of my father, you know? So that's something I have the fortune and to have. I guess the example I provided to you, you know, I went to study statistics as an undergrad. I went to market research because of my statistical background and I study and try to learn more things. That's what gave me the opportunity to go to the U.S. and then go to Venezuela. And that exposure at a very early age is what I am today. But I was prepared. Something I speak a lot to students is, but be prepared. You know, I was reading a quote the other day that says, and I'm paraphrasing, that fortune benefits those who are prepared. Of course, there's a certain amount of luck, but if you are prepared to take that luck, you know, uh, you'll be successful. And I think uh, that's a piece, the preparation, the pushing of my father to be the best, to study and to be ready is what defined me today, you know? Yeah, I agree. I agree. So what fuels you? What drives you on a day-to-day basis? I guess meeting People from different backgrounds. That fuels me and drives me every day, you know. I love to learn new things. That's why probably I, I move a lot, you know. And uh, <laughs> it's just to move around, learn new things. Learn that everybody has a chance. Everybody has a story behind and it's important to listen. And that's, I think, what drives me is just meet people, meet different perspectives. I have always been a believer that two heads always think better than just mine. And uh, so, not just one. So that's what drives me, just really to meet different backgrounds of people and put our thoughts together to solve things, you know? So That's good. That's good. Well, if we step back from your brand that you manage at Nestle and the Nestle, you know, maybe even the Nestle portfolio, you know, are there brands or companies or causes you think other people should be taking notice of? I think follow what you're passionate about. I don't know if there are brands or companies or causes that people, I should think others to take notice of. I mean, yeah, we can talk about trends, uh, the, we were discussing earlier these crypto cryptocurrencies, the blockchain technology. That's actually very interesting. I'm not a technical person, so I will never be able to understand <laughs> how exactly that works. <laughs> but it will impact businesses, you know, and I think you need to understand the impact on the business. I think follow trends, follow brands that are 
redefining categories. You know, one big example is Chobani. You know, it's impressive what they have done. I, many years ago, I was in General Mills, and the impact that Chobani has had in just a few years on General Mills' businesses and overall, on overall consumer behavior is impressive. So follow those trends that are redefining industries, redefining things, uh, both... Uh, I mean, I think it goes to business because I was thinking even follow political things or societal changes, but that, that will impact businesses. As we discuss, if if the population shrink, that impacts businesses. You know, so try to follow those trends and see where they are going and see what the impact is and your business. And then, but also follow your passion. You know, I then follow what you feel you are passionate about. You know, for example, I'm particularly interested, as I said, in Latin America and the human rights there and, and the violation of human rights there. So from a personal standpoint, I follow some causes on, on that area. So so follow follow things that impact your business and follow things that you are passionate about, you know? So so that I would, I would just my thoughts on that. Yeah, no, that's good advice. That's good advice. Last question for you. What do you see the future of marketing looking like? Hopefully for marketing, helping people make better or smarter choices. Use of technology and the amount of information and data that we have today has made marketing more efficient in a sense sometimes. I I don't know if it's... I think you can target better than in the past since you don't have that much data and you have much more data today. But at the same time, you know, I was discussing the other day with my wife and other colleagues. I feel, and I started to form some thoughts on this, that marketing is becoming a bit too transactional. If you click on something, then you'll get a banner ad. You know, if you move here, then you you, you know your consumer behavior, you, you may target that consumer better to buy something. But it feels too transactional today. It's very, in a sense, invasive. I think we are losing and we need to be probably better prepared to still do our storytelling, you know? Again, the storytelling will not come from the company like in the past you know and we put an advertisement and these are your 30 seconds and this is what my brand does for you it's, it needs to be more organic today of course we need to participate and involve our consumers in the storytelling in the content creation but do storytelling again hopefully the market in the future the technology that we'll have in the future will allow us to continue to build that storytelling because brands that are meaningful again and relevant and have a purpose will succeed and hopefully the technology in the future will help to that instead of being just a transaction i hope we get there too that's good advice jose thank you so much for coming on the show today alan thank you very much i enjoyed it was fantastic marketing today is brought to you by atomic atomic focuses on unleashing the growth potential for clients we serve Atomic is a strategic consultancy specializing in business, marketing, brand, and innovation. Our singular goal is to help you accelerate your efforts with the right mix of expertise, analysis, and creativity. Check us out at atomic.com. A-T-O-M-C-K dot com. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with project management by Sarah Williams, audio production by Aaron Campbell, writing and editing by Kevin Greeley, social media support by Megan Woods, art and graphic design by Sarah Dell. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. We love to hear from listeners at info at atomic, A-T-O-M-C-K dot com. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Marketing Today.